Hey there, a few days ago I uploaded my Why Spotify Will Ultimately Fail video, and since then I've gotten a few requests to do interviews for financial websites and podcasts and things like that. I figured that it would be far more efficient and useful to just make a simple video here responding to some of the questions and comments to my initial Spotify video than it would be to participate in some sort of clickbait article or something like that. So. Let's get into it. Spooky808 PlayStation 1 says, I can't with the gray eyebrow thing, LMAO. I pray it's not died unfathomably cringe. I actually honestly really love it when I get comments making fun of my eyebrow or commenting on my eyebrow or my appearance in some way because that means that my face is being shown to somebody who's not seen my face before, which means that my video is being seen by people who are not in my usual demographic. So, success. So, Pattern Shift asks, Are you certain enough to short spot? And then it's a much longer novel of a comment that's actually a good read. I recommend finding it and reading it, but it's just not a good read out loud in a video like this. So firstly, to anybody watching this, this is not just a disclaimer, I genuinely mean this, do not take financial advice from me, because I make my decisions based on my own income and my own interests and my own risk level. Also, I highly recommend against margin trading unless you have years of experience with it and completely understand the insane amount of risks involved. I very rarely talk about investing on this channel or anywhere publicly because I don't want to make it look like I'm endorsing or recommending anything to anyone because I am absolutely not. So on to the question, if you can't tell, I'm probably better at smelling bullshit than I am at smelling success when it comes to companies like this. I'm probably more of a pessimist, even though I like to think of myself as a realist. And yes, I am short on Spotify, and I've held that short position since about February. I would have to be, like, mental institution-grade delusional to think that any video on my channel would affect the stock price of Spotify. But for the record, yes, my money is where my mouth is. Most of what I said in my video is not news to any competent investor or lender, and the trend of blitzscaling is now sort of seen as this out-of-control vehicle, and not that many people want to hop on it at the moment. So that, plus all of the things that I said in the video, are squeezing Spotify quite a bit to keep the capital coming in while they bet big on podcasting and more marketing and try and keep subscriber growth rising. A much bigger issue is that according to the just-released report from the Entertainment Retailers Association, Spotify seems to have hit a ceiling in growth in the UK, and if you count the 10% inflation levels in the UK in the last year, it actually shrank. Spotify has been around a couple years longer in the UK than it has here, so it's been able to mature a little bit better, and it's a very reliable indicator of what the market trends will be here in a few years. Also, Spotify is betting big on podcasts and hoping we all get addicted to them for when they finally have to jack up the membership fees and adoption of podcasts in the US has actually hit a bit of a ceiling, and it's still growing in the UK which is really bad when you consider that the adoption of Spotify is shrinking. In the meantime, unless there's some sort of wild card event that happens, Spotify is going to have to raise rates substantially in the UK while further squeezing royalties. So all of that on top of a looming bear market, on top of rising interest rates, on top of blitzscaling not really being that popular for venture capitalists at the moment, to me, it seems like Spotify has run out of time to prove that they can make a long-term sustainable profit. Jeremy P.O. asks two questions. One, what is the deal with online radio like NTS? Do they offer a fairer deal, or is it all the same? I could be completely wrong. The last I discussed this, NTS DJs got paid hourly. I don't know if musicians get paid anything outside of what they would get paid through a performance right organization, but I could be totally wrong. I'm probably better at answering number two. What are the ethics of streaming music by dead musicians? Would be interesting to block any living artist from your Spotify so you are forced to buy the music, but woefully impractical. If I were king of the entire world, while I was trying to figure out how exactly a utopian society for arts would <laughs> work, I would first make copyright expire upon death. As an artist, if I want my family to have some sort of nest egg after I die in a cave or however I go, I feel like it's my responsibility to buy life insurance or put some royalties aside and build that nest egg. I don't feel like it's the public's responsibility. You're welcome to disagree with me. Is there a code slash service that rips a list of all of the song names and playlists I have on my Spotify account so I don't lose them? Yes, Exportify exists, it's free, and it does this wonderfully. 
There's a link down there somewhere. Rudolph says, I really do like your content. You seem to be a really intelligent, well-informed guy, but since your NFT video and your assessment of Ethereum, et cetera, which to me was awkwardly optimistic, I'm kind of skeptical about your takes on this subject matter. If you think that my take on the current state of NFTs or Ethereum or cryptocurrency is optimistic, please rewatch that video or just search my name in NFT because it is definitely not optimistic. In fact, this very comment is sandwiched literally between two comments telling me that I'm too pessimistic about NFTs and cryptocurrency. If I want to be able to cover something with that many social variables objectively, then I'm going to have to play devil's advocate to some extent. And playing that devil's advocate helps explain how to look at things more objectively, if that makes any sense. And doing this on YouTube or social media where it's full of binary polarized subjective opinions. The result of that is a whole lot of people over here telling me that I'm closed minded about NFTs and cryptocurrency and I don't want artists to make money. And then a whole bunch of people on this side telling me that I'm a crypto grifter. So with all that being said, it is necessary for me to seem objective to you, my viewer. And that requires a lot of communication skills and I am still learning. And I appreciate comments like that because that means that I need to tweak something because I seem biased about something that I, I don't feel like I'm biased on. So I'm working on it. Scurvy Dan says, but Ben, anytime a comment starts with those two words, I have to take a deep breath. <sighs> but Ben, but Ben, I think you were right when you said decentralization. And the best way for that, that we know of right now, is blockchain. If someone could start a blockchain where artists could post their music as an NFT each time it was accessed or purchased. Okay, let me hop off right there. So for starters, decentralization is much older than crypto and it can be accomplished much more efficiently than it is in crypto. And I have a feeling that later in this video, I'll be discussing more on that. It would be very inefficient to have actual music files on a blockchain. And that's why non-fungible tokens are just tokens that essentially have URLs to a certain file. All they are are just like an ownership certificate to something that is otherwise publicly available. Mark Fendel says, DeFi and Tezos solves this problem. Yep, music NFTs. How does it solve this problem? The vast majority of music listeners do not want to invest in a highly volatile currency just to listen to music, nor do they want to pay gas fees, nor do I want to pay gas fees to collect my royalties. It's a bunch of extra steps for what could function better as an HTML file with a Skrill gateway. Look, I feel like I've had the exact same conversation about music NFTs for upwards of two years now, just with a different face each time. And I say this as somebody who really likes the Tezos project and invested in it early on. Here's my take on this. I don't listen to crypto evangelism. Myself and just about the entire internet is tired of and annoyed with crypto evangelism. Solve a problem and your project will succeed. It's as simple as that. I don't hate NFTs and I don't love NFTs because it would be absolutely ridiculous for me to have a strong emotional response about an immutable unit of data. I like the idea of crypto for things like initial offerings. And I think that blockchain has found itself very useful where small pockets of immutable data are required. Again, if your project solves a problem, you don't need to talk about blockchain or NFTs because it solves a problem and that sells itself. Like I said in my last video, I'm not interested in concocting or creating new ways to create artificial scarcity or gatekeeping information behind a financial wall. I think there's a better way to support artists. And so I'm going to ignore the dozens of other Web3 or blockchain or crypto related comments because they're all very similar to this one. Next, Alec Redfern says, seems that Spotify might be long overdue for a massive class action lawsuit. As much as I am a fan of justice and karma, I feel like a class action lawsuit would lead to me getting a $70 check and then a law firm in Boca Raton, Florida getting a $700 million check as that's unfortunately how most class action lawsuits end up. Chris Paul says, the music streaming service itself needs to be nationalized. We only need one. I think a relatively strong argument could be made for a massive client or archive that would have every single book, news article, scientific paper, music song, movie, TV show, etc. 
and then it would keep track of the downloads or rentals and then pay the artists or writers or musicians through an internet tax. And I realize that to some people this sounds insane, but for anybody who doesn't live in the United Kingdom, the BBC is actually mostly funded by a TV license fee or a TV tax. I would be interested to, at some point, do a pretty deep economic analysis to find out exactly how much the average American citizen would have to pay in IP tax for everything to operate the same way but be freely available. Brew some coffee, boys. What about Funk Whale? Funk Whale is a start. It is not the prettiest start, but most starts aren't that pretty. And I've actually had Funk Whale running on a server here previously just to see what kind of resources and bandwidth it requires. Is there an open source alternative for Spotify like Mastodon or Signal? Yes and no. Mastodon does not have your Twitter followers or all of the feeds that you have on Twitter, but it does have the same functionality that Twitter has, more or less at least. If you just want to put music on a server and then stream it to your phone, Mopity is great if you have a server that's running Linux. Uh, there's Ampachi, that's not that difficult to set up. I've been experimenting with a custom build to an open source one called Navidrome. There are actually quite a lot of options, come to think of it. Need for Tweed asks, I would love to know what Mr. Jordan earns from YouTube plays of his music specifically. Well, Mr. Tweed, I assume you mean YouTube music. And while it hasn't been that consistent before 2021, since then I've been paid about double what Spotify pays me per stream. Lofat says, you don't mention another reason to use a streaming service, the convenience of managing your existing music on multiple devices seamlessly. I pay Apple Music because I grew tired of copying music files around on it. Okay, Apple doesn't even let you access your own file system in its entirety on a lot of their devices. And as problematic as I think that is, I'm just going to recommend Plex and Plexamp. I think that'll accomplish what you're trying to do here and then also allow you to get media that is outside of Apple's walled garden. Big Red Apple Floppa says, so you're saying capitalism creates a problem, but the free market is a solution? I don't get it. Actual free market capitalism, scarcity is a continuous contingency of value, and scaling is almost always more valuable than creating scarcity for tangible things. That's why oil doesn't cost a thousand dollars a barrel. It would surely be easier to cut production by 90% and just charge an ass load for it, but at least in a free market, then somebody else would just capitalize on the demographic that wouldn't be able to afford to drive with that level of scarcity. Another way of looking at it, and probably a much healthier way of looking at it, is artificial scarcity attempts to make someone else's piece of the pie smaller so you could have a bigger one. And I am not a fan of that. I'm a fan of using technology to grow the entire pie. And with tangible things, we are doing that. We are growing the pie, even with things that seem rudimentary that we don't associate with technology, like agriculture. Look up world hunger plotted over time, and you'll notice that it's been on a steady decline. Thank God. When it comes to intellectual property, in my opinion, which may even count as a radicalized opinion, I think that future generations will look at our last century of lobbying the government to make sharing freely available information a criminal offense, and we won't be able to wrap our heads around the concept. This is a general response to quite a few comments calling for the return of physical mediums like CDs or vinyl. I'm not a big fan of this, and I say this as somebody who ran a record label that shipped physical mediums for 20 years. For me, a The Flashbulb CD release required quite a lot of lead time, it required one to two employees for pick and packing. It required the padded mailers, postage meters, five figures of postage at least, transaction fees, scales, custom forms, customer support. And CDs are easily the most profitable way to make money selling a physical medium with your music on it. And if you don't have at least a few hundred fans who are willing to give you 20 to 25 bucks with shipping included, for a CD, and most of them say they will, not all of them will, then you're in for a substantial loss. And then vinyl, a limited run of 200 vinyl discs, uh, 140 gram, nothing fancy, full color artwork sleeve, but no additional artwork. You're designing all the artwork yourself. That's gonna cost about $19 per vinyl disc to make. 
it's going to be about a six month lead time and then you have to ship it again so if you're an american artist only shipping in the united states the price you would have to charge to break even if you were to sell out of every single disc would be about 32 dollars and wouldn't you rather 200 fans just pay a musician $6,400 that they get to keep to make more content with. And all of this is completely ignoring the god-awful environmental aspect of all of this, and my soapbox for that can be seen right here. <laughs> I know I said that I was done answering any crypto-related questions, but I do have quite a few comments asking me my opinion about Audius. Audius, for those who don't know, was initially introduced and sold as the web 3 version or alternative to spotify or streaming services that would free artist royalties and make artists much more money using crypto as yada 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 they made their own cryptocurrency which you have to buy and last i checked you couldn't buy it with fiat currency you'd have to like go through bitcoin or ethereum first and i know quite a few artists who have been on Audius and had their music there and never got a dime of royalty even in their own cryptocurrency. The great thing about blockchain is that you have a public ledger that anybody can audit. And 12 to 16 months ago, I looked at that ledger and not with a microscope either. I didn't comb through it. I just looked at it and it seemed like nearly 90% of all Audius coins were owned by two different wallets. It just looked a lot like a pump and dump. Basically, what I'm trying to say here is that in my opinion, Audius is a scam for multiple reasons, and they don't even try to cover their tracks or hide it. And some people are just so hyped on Web3 and crypto that they don't even care, I guess. I don't know. I would stay the hell away from it. Pacoyo says, among other things, this video glosses over one thing. Streaming services are great for the consumer. I didn't gloss over that at all. Movie Pass was great for the film watching consumer. Uber is great for the consumer, even though it's bleeding billions of dollars. These are venture capital funds subsidizing an upgrade in your lifestyle. And that's great for the consumer right now. But that's obviously not the business model. The business model is growing until you have monopolized the entire market and then pulling a bait and switch with your customers and charging them a whole lot more for a whole lot less, hence being able to make more profit than the industry in which they replaced. And if that doesn't work, and usually it doesn't, then something like Uber would leave you with a decimated cab and food delivery industry. And so these types of business models are actually, over time, really bad for consumers, whether they succeed or fail in most cases. And what makes a business model like a streaming service or Spotify so much more dangerous and, and so much more prone to failure is that they are competing with free. Either they lose artists or the subscription rates go up or both, either which will slow growth in its tracks while high interest rates and debt looms. Yori Otaku says, so what you're telling me is that we need to move all music to the last place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism, space. <laughs> Two problems with that. Atmospheric pressure is relative to gravity, so I suppose to be able to make a sound system loud enough for a human to be able to hear it upwards of the Kármán line, I don't know how you would get that much energy. And the second thing, there's plenty of startup capitalism happening in space. Unfortunately, so much that we have a massive space debris problem now. Spotify won't fail. Do you know how many labors in the world use Spotify while they work? A shit ton of them. I don't blame you, though. You look like you haven't picked up a shovel in your life, let alone how to do your eyebrows, all four of them. <laughs> I feel like some old British man started shaming me for not looking like I'm a coal miner and then he had to go to the bathroom or something and then his wife sat down at the computer and started shaming me for not knowing how to do my eyebrows. Tristan Tobias asks, would a not-for-profit streaming service work? Paying the employees a decent salary and proper royalties distributed to musicians but not having it a publicly listened, I imagine it means listed company, so not needing to have to do the constant growth to pay shareholders? What are the pros and cons? So in my life, I've run four nonprofits total. One was a music school, one was a community center, one was a record label, and one was a licensing manager publisher. And all of them were 100% self-sustainable. And when a nonprofit is self-sustainable, it is extremely efficient. But a lot of nonprofits are charities. 
And so they're not as efficient because they have to put a lot of resources into finding donors. So Spotify, for example, has to have salespeople and management for advertisements. A simple democratized rating process doesn't really work for them. They need to constantly tweak an algorithm to get more people listening and building a music library that they can depend on so they continue being subscribers. Then they also have to manage the marquee program where musicians pay for prioritization in that algorithm. Of course, they have to manage all the individual legal agreements with major labels and media conglomerates. They have to manage sponsorships. They have to manage partnerships with other companies for scaling, for example, the Spotify button on a Roku remote. And then all of these departments need human resources, management, recruiters. So yeah, there's a whole lot of fat. So back on the nonprofit side of things, the big con with starting a nonprofit replacement for Spotify is that it would require everything to come out of pocket because nobody wants to invest in a company that's not going to make a profit. And I say this as somebody who is providing the pocket for this very thing, uh, it sucks. But the silver lining with funding a project like this as a sole individual or a small team is that the frugality kind of brute forces efficiency and that efficiency is pretty much there the entire project because you don't have venture capital dollars to gain the type of fat and you also don't need the growth to try and get those. But I feel like I'm just speaking in a circle at this point. <laughs> I'm actually starting to lose my voice and I just looked over and now I have 1,048 comments. So I'm sure there's a lot more questions. I would like to maybe have this conversation a little bit more in a more interactive way. I have a streaming channel called Alpha Basic Live. It is just at Alpha Basic. You could subscribe to it. And yeah, I stream once a week, usually every Thursday. If you want to get involved with the decentralized music streaming thing and hopefully before the end of the month even be able to try an early demo of it, then you can find that on my Discord, which you can get for $1 on my Patreon. But also on my Patreon, of course, is everything from game servers, monthly songwriting challenges, a bunch of audio assets, unreleased music, and so on. And again, it's as cheap as a dollar. It's a pretty dang good deal. I'm going to go work on another video now. And uh, thanks for listening to me just talk to a lens. And have a great week. Okay, keep creating. Bye.